Hello, Saddleback. I want to say hi to all of our campuses watching live, the different locations, those joining us online. If you'll take out your message notes inside your program. The series that we've been in now for several weeks, Choosing Your Future, is uh, <clears throat> actually just the appetizer for the real series that we're going to start on Easter Sunday, which will be our 2018 spiritual growth campaign. And you know that we do these campaigns once a year to help give you a kind of a booster shot to get you growing for the year. Starting at Easter, the series is gonna be called The Doors to Your Destiny. The Doors to Your Destiny. And um, I spent most of the last year in my personal quiet time studying every time the word door is used in the Bible. And in all the different translations, it's used, I don't know, probably mm, 400 or so times. And doors are metaphors. Uh, they're metaphors for a lot of important things in your life. And sometimes God opens doors in your life and sometimes God shuts doors in your life. And we're gonna be looking at all that. Doors have a great spiritual significance. Now I wanna begin by first pointing out that you have doors all the time in your life and you don't even realize how many doors you walk through or you use every single day. If I were to ask you to make a list, count up right now, how many doors are in your home? Well, you think front door, maybe back door, and, and, and you know that's a few other things. No, no, you got a lot of doors in, in your life. So I wanna have a little quiz here. Uh, and I want you to raise your hand if you have these in your home. Do any of you have a sliding door in your home? All right. Uh, anybody have a pocket door? You know what a pocket door is? Okay, some of you have a pocket door. Uh, any of you have a front door? <laughs> if you don't, how are you getting in? <laughs> All right. Uh, anybody have a basement door? I didn't figure. This is California. We don't have basement doors. Anybody have a Dutch door? You know what I'm talking about? The cut now. Are you Dutch? <laughs> All right, we have Dutch doors, all right? Um, anybody have a garage door? Yeah, we've all got that one, okay? Uh, does anybody have a fire-rated door? If you don't know what it is, you don't have one, all right? All right. Uh, attic door, anybody have an attic door? Okay, bathroom door. <laughs> if you didn't raise your hand, you said, I highly suggest you get one. All right. uh, for sound and smell, two reasons, okay? All right, you need a bath, trust me, you need a bathroom door, okay? <laughs> Anybody have an automatic door in their home? Automatic opens and closes, all right, all right. Um, shower door, yeah, good. Uh, closet door, good, all right. Uh, bedroom door, yeah, you need a bedroom door, definitely too, all right? Does anybody have a revolving door? Not unless you live in a hotel, one of those, you know, the doorman kind of guy. Uh, glass door, anybody have a glass door? Got it, all right. Uh, jammed door or squeaky door? <laughs> all right. Does anybody have a trap door in their house? I am not coming to your house, God bless you. Uh, all right. Magic door, anybody have a magic door? How about anybody have a secret door? It's no longer a secret. <laughs> Now, as I said, doors can have a great spiritual uh, significance in your life. A door can be an entrance or it can be an exit. Uh, it can be a bridge to something great or it can be a barrier. A door can say welcome or a door can say you're not welcome. It, it can represent acceptance or it can represent rejection. I can't get past that door. It can be a gateway or a portal. Uh, it can keep things separate. Doors keep critters out of your house, uh, keep the warm or the cool air in. Uh, a door can protect you. A door can provide access. There's so many implications to how doors are used in your life, but there are also many, many implications how they are used spiritually uh, in your life. In the Bible, a door can represent <clears throat> the, the, um, the entrance door of salvation. Uh, or the um, 
the passage door of discipleship or the service door of ministry or the, the outside door to your mission in life. It, it could be the access door of prayer or the holy door of worship uh, or, or the, uh, the door to fellowship in life. Uh, there are a lot of implications for the doors in your life. It could, the Bible calls the Bible itself is called a door. It is the mirrored door of God's word. The Bible says the, the word is like a mirror. And we, when we read the book of God, it's not just telling us about God. It, it mirrors what we're really like. Now our theme verse uh, for this series is the verse there on your outline. <clears throat> Revelation chapter three, verses seven and eight. And uh, this is gonna take us through uh, eight weeks of our full, uh, spiritual growth campaign for this spring. Now the background of this verse is this. Uh, in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, by the way, it's not revelations, it's not plural, it's the book of Revelation, the Revelation. Uh, Jesus starts that book by giving messages to seven actual churches that were in existence at that time. And one of them is to the church at Philadelphia. 2,000 years before there was a Philadelphia, America. There was a Philadelphia in what is now modern day Turkey. Philadelphia in Greek means city of brotherly love. Phileo is brotherly love and Delphia, city of brotherly love. And Jesus has a message to the city, the church in the city of Philadelphia and here's what he says. Look on your outline. Jesus says, I hold the key of David in my hand. You say, what's that? Well, I'm gonna explain it in the series, so I won't deal with it now, but you need this key. You, you need this key in your life to unlock a lot of things, open doors in your life. I hold the key of David in my hand. The doors that I unlock and open, no one else can close. And any doors that I shut and lock, no one will ever be able to open. Now I know, Jesus says to this church, I know everything you've done. So look, I'm placing before you an open door that no one can shut. And he says, now I know you're not very strong. He's very honest about this. But you've kept my word and you've been faithful to me. Now this is what's called the door of opportunity. And he's saying, okay, I know you don't have it all together. You're not that strong spiritually, but at least you stayed with me. And you're here, you're still showing up and you haven't denied me. And so I'm going to open an incredible door of opportunity to you. You're not, as, you're not perfect. I know you're not really spiritually strong, but I'm gonna give you the opportunity of your lifetime. I'm opening up a door of opportunity to you. And he says, I've got this key of David, which by the way is a reference to Isaiah 22:22. Now, what he just says there, this has happened many, many times in my life where God has opened doors for me that I would have no way been able to open on my own. And I find myself in situations sometimes just kind of pinching myself and amazing, goes, I'm here, I'm doing this. And I could have never opened this door on my own. But God opened the door for me. God has done this for our church, Saddleback Church, many, many times over the last four decades where he's opened enormous doors around the world where we are the only church that's actually sent members to minister in every country of the world, 197 countries. And 26,000 members have gone overseas on a peace plan and all kinds of doors have been opened because of the goodwill that we've shared that are available to Saddleback Church that have not been available to other churches. God opened those doors. But here's why we're gonna do this series. I believe God wants to open some major doors in your life, doors to your future, doors that you've always dreamed of opening, ideas, dreams, vision. Specifically in this series, we're gonna look ahead to the next three years. I wanna help you plan out the next three years of your life. And I'm gonna actually help you write out a vision statement of what doors you wanna see God open in the next three years in your life. And since it's 2018, 19, and 20, we're gonna call this the 2020 vision. So what's, what is God gonna do in your life between now and the end of 2020? And I, in this 
series, I'm gonna help you write out a 2020 vision of the doors that God has opened in your life and the doors that you want God to open in your life. And in the series, we're gonna look at how God opens doors, why he opens them, where he opens them, what you need to do to get ready for the open doors while you're waiting on God to open a door in your life. What do you do during that time? We're gonna look at all of the implications about um, looking at the doors that God wants to open in your life. So I told you I've spent the last year studying this concept of doors all through scripture. And I made a list of over 50 lessons that God wants us to understand about the implications about the doors we have in our lives. Now, since last week's message was so long, <laughs> I'm not gonna give you all 50 this week. I'm mean, just gonna give you seven. Last week's message had a lot of points. This week's message will be pointless. No, it won't, it'll have seven. So you can write these down. What you need to know about doors in your life. This is really just an introduction to where we're gonna go in our 2018 spiritual growth uh, emphasis. Okay, number one, first thing you learn. Every door is a decision. Every door is actually a decision. In the Bible, doors are metaphors for the choices that we make Every day. That's why I was leading up to this with what I call choosing your future. That your choices, not your circumstances, determine your destiny more than anything else. Now, every door you walk by, you have a choice. Am I going to walk uh, through it or not? And uh, you learn pretty early in life that there are some doors you shouldn't walk through. Uh, there are some doors you can't walk through. Uh, there are some doors that you... Uh, aren't worth working, walk, walking through, but every time you see a door, you've got a decision. Will I go through it or not? Okay, number two. My destiny will be shaped by which doors I walk past and which doors I walk through. Your destiny, your future for your life will be determined by your choices, your decision, every door is a decision, and it will be determined by which doors you walk through and which doors you walk past. Now the tough part is knowing the right door because every time you walk through the door, there's a cost of time, of money, there's a cost in partnership. Uh, let me make this real clear. True confession time. How many of you have ever walked through a door you thought was the right door and it was the wrong door. Can I see your hands? Yes. The rest of you are liars. <laughs> and have you noticed that when you walk through the wrong door, it's often not easy to get back on the path. It's not like you can just turn around and go, oh, made the wrong decision and one step out and now you're back on the path again instantly. There's some doors you walk through and it takes years to get back on track. You know what I'm talking about. It takes years. So you don't want to make a bad use of time and money and effort and energy and all those things. You wanna make the wise decisions up front. And what do you need to know to, to choose the right doors and not the wrong doors in front of you? You have to have what the Bible calls is discernment. And I'm going to teach you in this series, one of the goals is to teach you how to have discernment. The more discerning you are, the more wise you'll be, and the better decisions you're going to make in life. The Bible says in Deuteronomy um, 30, verse 15, God says, today I'm giving you a choice. You can choose life and success, or you can choose death and disaster. Now here's the problem. Sometimes you can't see what's behind the door. Remember Monty Hall, door number one, door number two, door number three, and you could say door number three, and you either get a car or you get a candy bar. <laughs> and they're not the same. And so you go, I wanna make sure that I choose the right doors so I'm not wasting time, money, energy, and effort in the rest of my life. How do you make those decisions? Discernment. And we will talk about that. One of the ways discernment is especially important is in your relationships. Some of you, I love you, but you are consistently making the wrong decisions about relationships. And, and 
I don't think less of you, I love you, but the fact of the matter is you had a history of one bad relationship after another. And when you talk to me about it, you say, you know, I, you know, what's the problem here? I said, well, first, let's consider what's the common denominator in every one of these relationships? <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you. Okay, so obviously here's an issue. It has something to do inside of you. Now, I love you unconditionally as your pastor, but the truth is some of you have broken choosers. Broken choosers. You're just not very good at choosing the right relationship. Let me be frank, you suck at it, okay? And you consistently go to one bad relationship after another. You need help, that's why I'm here. And that's why this church is here. You need some good women and some good men in your life who can help you get that broken chooser restored and get some discernment in there. And that's so, so important that you learn because your destiny will be determined by your decisions and your decisions are determined by what doors you, you go through. Okay, number three, a door may be different things. First, it may be an opportunity from God. Those are the good doors you wanna go through. When God gives you an opportunity, and I believe that in the next three years that God is going to give you, many of you, wide open doors like he just did to the church at Philadelphia. He said, I'm gonna give you a wide open door. He's gonna open up doors that are gonna blow your mind. And if you walk through them in the right way at the right time and do the right thing, it's gonna be amazing in your life. Good example of a door of opportunity from God is 1 Corinthians 16, nine. Paul says, a huge door of opportunity for good work has opened up here. Now, I left the second half of that verse off because I'm gonna teach on it later, but here's what the second part of that verse says. It says, a huge door of opportunity has opened up for me here and there is much opposition. Opportunity plus opposition equals God's will. When God has a door and he opens it for you, it's the right door. It doesn't mean it's gonna be a problem-free door. Oh, no, no. You're gonna have to grow in character. You may walk through the right door and you hit a buzzsaw. And you go, wait a minute, I thought that this was the door God wanted me to go through. He did. But there are problems. It's not a problem-free life, God's will. God's will means I'll help you solve those problems. So he says, there's an opportunity but there's also opposition. There's always opposition with every opportunity. You will never have an opportunity from God that is not opposed by evil. And, and so you should expect opposition even when you know I'm doing the right thing. But there's an opportunity from God. The right door doesn't mean no problems. It means that you just, God has given you this opportunity. Now, it could be an opportunity from God, or B, a door may be a distraction from others. And we all know what this one is. It looks like a good opportunity, but it actually ends up being a distraction, keeps you from doing what God wants you to do. And when you walk through that door, it ends up being a dead end, or it ends up getting you off track. And it, 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 that's why you need discernment. Because not every door is an opportunity from God. Some of them are distractions from other people. God has a wonderful plan for your life, but so does everybody else. And they're gonna offer you all kinds of opportunities that sound good on how you could use your time, your money, your energy, and they're not good, they're just distractions, okay? So when I see an open door, that doesn't mean it's automatically God's will. It doesn't mean that it's what I'm called to do with my life. It doesn't mean that's my purpose or that's my dream. It's just an open door. And you have to be able to discern, is it from God or is it a distraction from other people? A good example of this is the story of, uh, of Nehemiah in the Old Testament in the Bible. Now, uh, the Jews were taken captive. You remember this when we studied the book of Daniel. And they were moved to Babylon. And then the Persians overcame the Babylonians, and um, in this situation, Nehemiah rises up to the top in leadership. He's like the chief servant for King Artaxerxes, the, the king of, of Persia. 
And Nehemiah is sad because his hometown, Jerusalem, he's not living in Jerusalem anymore, he's living over in Persia, which is modern day Iran. And he's, he's seen his country devastated, decimated, and destroyed. And all the walls around his hometown, Jerusalem, have all been torn down, which means that the people there are vulnerable to thieves and bandits and terrorists, and there's no protection. This makes Nehemiah sad. So he decides to start praying about it. And he starts praying for God to open the door for him to do something about this situation he sees that is not good. And there's a lot in our society you could be praying about that God would open a door for you to do something about it. And so he starts praying. He says, God, I, I, I want you to build, I want to be able to build a wall around Jerusalem, rebuild the wall so that the people, my hometown, my, my friends, my families are protected. And uh, he's thinking through a plan. He fasts for it, he prays about it, and he just waits. One day, uh, King Artaxerxes comes in and Nehemiah's his chief servant. He goes, Nehemiah, you're looking kind of down in the mouth today, a little, a little gloomy. Uh, you know, are you depressed? What's, what's going on? And uh, Nehemiah goes, I'm sad. He goes, well, what are you sad about? He goes, because my hometown lies in ruins. And, uh, you know, the people there are unprotected and they're being tortured and they're being threatened and they're, they're, you know, people are taking advantage of them. It's a devastated city. And, and, and King Artaxerxes could have just blown it off and done nothing, but he says, what would you like for me to do for you? Boom, big open door. A pagan king, who's the leader of the biggest empire at the time, all of a sudden says to a servant, what would you like for me to do for you? This is an enormous open door. And Nehemiah has been prepared for it, and he says, well, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to let me to go back there, let me rebuild the city, I wanna do this, this, and this. The king goes, well, how long do you think it's gonna take? He tells him. What is, well, how much money it's gonna take? He tells him. Nehemiah has thought it all out. Now, this is a very important point you need to understand. Sometimes you're waiting on God for him to open a door in your life, a job door, a relationship door, something like that. What do you do while you're waiting on God? You plan so that when the door opens, you know exactly what to say. If tomorrow somebody walked up to you out of the blue and said, um, you know, uh, God's leading me to help you out. Uh, what do you want to do with your life and how could I help you out with it? Would you be able to give them a plan? Would you have a written out vision? Here's what I'd like to do in my life for the next three years or five or 10. If you, while you're waiting, you don't just sit around doing nothing. You do the planning, waiting on God for the timing to open. He'll, he'll pick the right time. That's what happened with Nehemiah. He, when, when the king says, what would you like for me to do? He knew, what, he knew what to do. And he tells him all the stuff. And so the king goes, great, fine, good, let's go. You have my permission, and here's what you can take with you in terms of resources. Would you be willing, would you be ready to do that? See, a lot of people think, well, to, faith means if God hadn't opened a door, I'd just sit around and kind of wait, watch TV and eat bonbons. No, 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 that's called laziness. While you're waiting, God is working. And while God is working to get all the things in place for what you want, you need to be planning. I'm going to help you in this series write out a plan for your next three years. So if something opens up for you, you already are ready to do it. Now, the king lets um, Nehemiah go back to his home in Israel and back to his hometown of Jerusalem and he starts rebuilding the wall. But not everybody wanted the wall to be rebuilt. There were enemies. These people who were the thieves and the bandits and the other nations and the terrorists, they didn't want that wall rebuilt. And so they do everything they can to discourage this guy named Nehemiah from completing this big building project. And they start off by just attacking him, uh, criticizing him. And then they move from criticism to ridicule. They start to make fun of him. That doesn't slow him down. Uh, then they try to put some barriers in the way. Uh, at one point, they threaten him. They intimidate him. One time they say, we're gonna kill you. And none of this works. He just, God's opened the door. He just keeps on keeping on. He's totally focused. He's purpose-driven. And so finally, they decide, okay, we're gonna just, if we can't get him to stop, we'll just delay it. And there are people in your life who if they can't get you to stop doing God's will, they just get you to delay it. 
And so they come in and they said, why don't you come discuss it with us? Now, they, they weren't planning on changing. They just wanted, it's a delay tactic. Discussion is often a delay tactic. And Nehemiah's going, why would I come discuss something with you when I already know what is God's will? I don't need to discuss it with you because I'm not gonna change my mind. And here's what he says, Nehemiah 6, verse three. So I sent messengers to them, that's the critics, with this reply. I'm doing an important work right now. Why should the work stop while I come down to see you? Some of you need to say that to some people. You need to say, why should I stop doing what I'm doing? I know this is what God wants me to do. Why should I come discuss it? It isn't gonna change anything. I'm gonna keep doing it. You see, this is an open door of distraction. Come discuss it with us. And, and you can miss the real doors that God has in your life by walking through doors that other people opened up that you went through that one instead of this one and you missed it, okay? So it may be an opportunity, it may be a distraction. Number three, a door can be a trap from Satan. It can be, can be a trap from Satan. And there are, ladies and gentlemen, trap doors in this world and many of us have fallen into them. Matthew 16, verse 23, Jesus says, get away from me, Satan. You're a dangerous trap to me. You're looking at things merely from a human viewpoint, not from God's. Anytime I look at my future from a human viewpoint instead of God's, that's a trap. Anytime I look at my problems from a human viewpoint instead of God, that's a trap. So you've got to know, is it an opportunity from God? Is it a distraction from others? It is a trap from Satan. Now here's the fourth thing you need to know that I've learned from the word. If an open door is truly from God, here's one of the ways you know, one of the ways, it will not contradict what God has already said in his word. If a door is truly from God, an open door is truly from God, it will not contradict what God has already said in his word. Now, there are a lot of things God says in his word. He says, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, do this, do this. God will never tell you something different. And if a, if a door tells you something different, it's not a door from God. Let me give you an example. Um, let's say you're in a marriage right now that's going nowhere, and you're really pretty dissatisfied with it, and it's gotten worse and worse, and the more it's gotten worse, you're not growing together, you're actually growing apart, and, and you're distracted, and uh, you're disappointed by your marriage. And so now you're looking for a door out. Truth is, you're looking for a door out, but you don't really see anyone. And, uh, and, and so you're working every day, and, you're, and, and one day at work, they put a new employee right next to you. And you're a guy, let's say, and you're dissatisfied with your wife at home and your marriage, and, and all of a sudden they put next to you a gorgeous woman who is nice to you. And she doesn't complain, she compliments you. And, 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 and when she says, can I get you this? And at home, your wife's saying, get it yourself. <laughs> and, and, and then you fall in this trap of foolishly comparing tangerines and submarines, they're not the same. <laughs> they sound alike, but they are not the same, okay? You know, when you're at your work, you look your best, smell your best, taste your best. You know, you just, it's a phony picture of you. It's not you sitting on the couch eating bonbons, as I said. So. And, and so then you start being attracted to this person. And, and the reason I'm telling you this is because I've heard it over and over and over in 40 years of talking to guys. And they'll say, you know, Rick, it's like God just opened a door to this woman. She's everything I've ever wanted and my wife is everything I don't want. And, and, and I know God wants me to be happy. Well, he does, but he knows what'll make you happy and he knows what will not make you happy. And I said, well, it must be God's will. So I'm, gonna, I'm having this affair and I'm, gonna do, I'm so happy in it. So I'm, I'm gonna divorce my wife and, 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 and marry this other woman. Must be an open door. Absolutely not. Why? Well, in the first place, Proverbs says, whoever commits adultery is a fool. Second, the Bible says in Proverbs, whoever commits adultery destroys his own soul. The Bible says, 
that it causes all kinds of pain, not just in your life, but in future generations. I have, can a person be forgiven? Of course they can. But you know what? It doesn't remove the scars. And I've never met anybody who was in an affair who said it was painless. It is never painless. There's always enormous pain that comes along with an affair. Always, emotional, spiritual, physical, and, and, and other ways. And so an open door from God will not contradict what he's already said. And if God says, don't do this, God's not gonna open a door for you to do it. That door is a trap. It's not uh, an opportunity, it, it, it is a trap. And so you don't start looking for you know, ways to, to defend yourself. Now, we say, well, then what do I do? I'm in a marriage that I, I, don't, you know, I don't feel good about. The grass is, green, is not greener on the other side of the fence. No matter how much you think it is. The grass is not greener on this side of the fence. The grass is greener where you water it. And if you spent as much time cultivating your marriage as you do complaining about it, it would be different. Grow up. Accept responsibility. You say, well, I can't change him. I can't change her. You're right, but you can change you. You can't change anybody else. You can't. But here's what happens in a relationship. When you change yourself, it forces the other person to change. Because they can't relate to you in the same way. And the old patterns don't work anymore because you're acting in a different way. Now you're kind. You don't retaliate. You don't blow up. You're being nice. You're acting loving. You say, well, I don't feel very loving. It's easier to act your way into a feeling than to feel your way into an action. If you wait for the feelings to come, you're never gonna feel loving. But if you start acting by choice, choosing to act in loving ways toward your spouse, you know what? The feelings will come back. Feelings always follow actions, not reverse. If you start acting loving, you'll start feeling loving. And, and it'll come back to you. So you act your way into a feeling. And you say, well, I'm waiting on him or her to make the first move. No, this is what it calls, this is what it means to be a leader. Leaders make the first move. Guys, you want your wife to treat you like a king? Treat her like a queen. Ladies, you want your husband to treat you? Wait a minute before you clap. This is a double barrel point. If you want your man, your husband, to treat you like a queen, treat him like a king. Now you all can clap, okay? okay. But don't go around saying, well, God opened the door for me to have this affair. That was not from God, all right? Because he will never contradict his word. In Matthew 24, 35, Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. If it was true a thousand years ago, it'd be true now and a true in a thousand years from today. And if it was wrong a thousand years ago, it's still wrong today and it'll be wrong a thousand years from today. Number five, the fifth thing I've learned about doors. This is an important one. Sometimes God shuts a door for my protection. And you think it's a bad thing that you lost your job or something went sideways. But God shuts a door sometimes for your protection. In Genesis 7, 16, it says five words. Then God shut the door. You know what that's talking about? Noah and the ark. Once they're on the ark and Noah's done everything God told him to do and he's got the animals and his family, it says God shut the door. And when God shuts the door, nobody's gonna open it. And when God opens the door for you, nobody can shut it including your ex or your critics or your parents. If God opens the door for you, nobody can shut it. If he shuts it, don't even try to open it. Why did God shut the door for Noah? To protect them from all the rain and the storm. And sometimes that happens in your life. It doesn't feel good, but it's for your protection. You might have gotten fired, but you don't know why you got fired. And it doesn't even make sense, but God had a bigger plan. Uh, there's a guy in our church who's been a member since the first service in 1980. I'm not gonna give his name, but he, there were three companies here in South Orange County, big companies that were all competing for the same uh, market. And this guy, a friend of mine, uh, was the vice president of one of the companies. 
And that company, uh, the president one day came to the vice president and this friend of mine, and he said, I want you to start doing this. And he asked him to do something unethical. And my friend, member of Saddleback said, I can't do that. Uh, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's unethical, it's wrong. And I'm, I'm sorry, I, I just can't do that. And he got fired. You go, whoa, a door is shut. You lose your source of income, that's a shut door. Didn't look very good at the time, but God was protecting this guy. Because about six months later, he gets hired as the president of the competition. And then the two other companies, because he's a man of integrity, his business just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing and God's hand of blessing is on it because God had opened that door after shutting the other door. And the other two businesses, because they were unethical, kept going lower and lower until finally they bought them, he bought them all out and he became the president of all three companies. <laughs> now, do you, think, do you think he knew that when he got fired? Of course not, but God knows how to shut doors to protect you and God knows how to open doors to, to, to bless you. I was picking on those of you who are married, so let me just say to those of you who are single adults, some of you have fallen in love with somebody and you love them deeply, but they're not good for you and they hurt you and they're inconsistent and one day they're that, you know, it's hug or slug. It's kind of like, I can't figure this person out. And, and, you, and, and, and then they've started to, to walk out of your life. Sometimes God removes a harmful person from your life for your protection. Do not run after them. Don't do it. When you do that, that's called codependency. Oh, please come back, please come back, please come back. I, I, you know, I know you don't treat me well, but, but just please come. You do not need them. God has shut the door. Do not run after them. Some of you needed to hear that today. They've walked out. You need to let them walk out because God has a bigger plan, a better idea, and a greater door for your life. He often shuts a door for your protection. Number six. Now, this is a real important one too, and we'll come back to it over and over in this series. But God will open doors for me if I open doors for others. This is a really important lesson you have to learn. God will open doors for me if I open doors for others. This is the golden rule. Uh, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. God wants you to learn to be a giver. He wants you to learn to be generous. The Bible says in Proverbs eleven twenty five, anyone who generously blesses others will be generously blessed. And when you refresh others, you will be refreshed yourself. Did you know that there are more command, more promises in the Bible? about generosity than any other subject. Now I'm not talking about just giving money. I'm not talking about tithing. I'm talking about just being generous all the time with people. Generous with your money, but generous with your time. Generous with your praise. Generous with your energy. Generous with your home. This is called hospitality. You're gonna hear me say this word over and over till you're tired of it because it's one of the key values of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Christians are to be known for their hospitality. What does that mean? It means you open your doors to other people. It means you're generous with other people. Now, why does God make generosity such a big deal? I mean, like I said, there's more promises that God will bless you if you bless others than any other subject in the Bible. Why? Because God is a generous God. God is a giver. God so loved the world that he gave. It's an evidence of love. Everything we have in life is due to God's generosity. The air you're breathing right now, the nose you're breathing it with, the lung it's going into, the beautiful clouds outside, the, the trees, the stars, everything you have, you didn't deserve. It's a gift of God's generosity. Now, you're made in God's image, and so God wants you to learn to grow up and be like him. God wants you to be a generous man. God wants you to be a generous 
woman. He wants generosity to be, he wants people to look at you and go, she's generous. He's generous. They're hospitable. They know how to make people feel welcome. They open their doors. And there are promises after promise after promise. God says, if you open doors for other people, that God will open doors for you because God is looking for people to bless. In Job 31, 32, Job says, I have never turned away anyone, but I have opened my doors to everyone. Now, I want to remind you that both before and after Job went through all his tough times, he was the wealthiest man in the world. I don't think it was an accident that he was the wealthiest man in the world because God looked down at him. Job could say, I've never turned away anyone, but I've opened my doors to everyone. He had an open door policy of blessing other people, helping other people, opening doors for other people. And God says, that's the kind of guy I can use, that I can bless. My life has been so blessed because people opened doors for me. When I was young, particularly, people opened doors for me. I told you about one of them last week when we talked about Billy Graham and his team. And how Billy Graham opened doors for me as a young man. I could have never, never, ever opened on my own. It was pure grace. He had the ability to open a door, to give a platform, and, and, and he did. And all my other mentors did the same. Peter Drucker opened doors for me. He gave me platforms. One time, he, he and Peter Drucker invited all of the, the most famous students he'd he had taught over the years, Jack Welch and, and Bill Gates and all these CEOs from major companies, GE. And he invited them all on his 90th birthday to come to um, uh, Claremont School. And he said, Rick, I want you to teach them uh, what businesses can learn from the church. That was a platform I would have never, ever had on my own. He opened that up for me. He had me do that. And, and, and so he opened doors for me. Now, if you've been here at Saddleback, I've opened a lot of doors for you. I've helped you to know God in a more intimate way. I've taught you the word of God. I've taught you how to see yourself differently, how to see life differently, how to see God, your past, your present, your future. I've opened a lot of doors for you. God wants you to open doors for other people. So I don't know how to do that. Well, that's one of the things we're gonna do in this series. I'm gonna teach you how to open doors for others. Why? Because the more you do that, the more God will open doors for you. And as your pastor, I want you to be blessed. I don't want you to miss any in this series. We're gonna start on Easter Sunday. We're starting with Jesus' text, I am the door. And and I'm gonna teach you, part of it will be how to open doors for other people. Because when God sees that, he goes, that's the kind of girl I can bless. That's the kind of guy I can bless. And he's gonna do that. I'm gonna help you do that. Okay, number seven. Let me give you one more. Sometimes God cracks open a door to give me a glimpse of my future long before I'm ready to walk through it. Why does he do that? Write this down to inspire me to grow. You're not quite ready for what God wants to do, but he wants to show you where he's gonna take you so you can get inspired, and then you get committed to going, oh, I need to get ready like Nehemiah, because I can see where he's gonna take me, and I wanna do what he wants me to do, and I wanna be ready, and so it inspires me to grow. God has a destiny for your life. By the way, no one can destroy your destiny, except you. God won't, the devil can't, other people can't. No no matter what people do to you, they cannot destroy your destiny. The only person who can destroy it is you because you make the wrong choices. God gives you, he's not gonna force his will on you. He's not gonna force you to enjoy what he's planned for your life. You can choose to ruin your life. You can choose to waste your life or you can choose the right doors to go through. So nobody else can destroy your destiny. You're the only one who can mess that up. And God says, come back to me and we'll get started on it again. Sometimes God cracks open a door and you get a little vision and go, whoa, that's what God might wanna do with me? And you have a dream and you have a vision. 
And we're gonna talk about vision a lot in this series. And, and he wants you to grow. When God gives you a little glimpse of it, God's vision, he never gives it to you all at once. God isn't gonna give you a map that shows you from the beginning to the end of your life. Why? Well, number one, it'd scare you to death. Because you go, holy moly, that's what God wants to do with me? Uh, and, and it would intimidate you, and he doesn't want you being afraid. Second, he wants to keep you close and dependent upon him, so he gives you it one part at a time. And he has a scroll, and you unroll the scroll, scroll and you, you do what that says, A, and then you unroll a little bit more, and you do B, and you unroll a little bit more, you see, you don't see the whole thing at once. It'd be overwhelming. So he wants to keep you close and dependent upon him, so he's gonna show you the vision a little bit at, at a time. And uh, the other thing is he wants to keep you growing. He knows where he's gonna take you, but you're not ready for it. Some of you have no idea the success and the blessing in ways that God wants to prosper your life, but you're not mature enough to handle it yet. And, and, and right now, you're a little too selfish. God wants you to learn to be about other people, and once you start opening the doors for other people, God goes, let's flip the switch. Now we're gonna pour out the blessing, because I know they're not gonna just think they're a rich, fat cat and you know, live for themselves. They've proven that they can handle the blessing that I wanna want to pour out on their life. Now here's what the Bible says about this. Habakkuk chapter two, verse three. We'll come back to this verse in the series too. God says, the things that I'm planning for you won't happen right away. But slowly, steadily, surely, the time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled. And we're gonna talk about the 2020 vision for you for the next three years. If it seems slow, do not despair. For these things will not, will surely come to pass. Just be patient. They will not be overdue a single day. During this campaign, uh, Doors to Your Destiny, I'm gonna help you, as I said, clarify and actually write down a vision statement. It's not gonna all come to pass in eight weeks. It's just getting it down on paper. It's just knowing where you're going. And in God's timetable, he will bring it to pass. See, here's the problem. A lot of times God opens the door a little bit and you get a little vision and go, oh, that's my dream for my life. I would love to do that. This is what God made me to do. This is what I really wanna do. And then we immediately, without waiting on God, run out and try to accomplish the vision in our own way and our own time, and we fall flat on our face. And then we come crawling back to God and we go, oh God, I'm so sorry. Uh, I really let you down. And God says, no, you didn't let me down because you weren't holding me up. <laughs> you can tweet that. <laughs> and then you go, God, I, I, I'm so sorry. Uh, did I just miss the vision? And you think maybe you, it wasn't really a vision from God, that dream that you have for your life. And God goes, no, 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 I gave you that vision. I gave you that dream. It's from me. You just didn't wait for part two and part three. A vision always has three parts. First, God says, here's what I'm gonna do in your life. And you usually get a little glimpse of that. And it's something that you'd really love to do. And you think, that would really be cool. And that would be me. And you get a vision. But then you don't wait for the second part, which is how. And the way God intends to fulfill the vision in your life is often the exact opposite of the way you think you should do it. And that's why you fall flat on your face and you come back. God said, you didn't wait for part two how I'm going to do this. And then you gotta wait for the third part, which is the timing, when. And God's timing is perfect. And when you're waiting, it's not like God isn't working. When you're waiting, you're supposed to be preparing. And when you're waiting, God is getting things lined up in the way that he wants to. And God can do more in five minutes on his timing than you can do in 50 years on yours. He can flip things around in amazing ways. I've seen it over and over again. So when he cracks that door, it's just helping you see where he wants to take you. Now, what are you gonna need to develop your vision for the next stage of your life? Well, you're gonna need three things, write these down. This is what you're gonna need, since we're gonna call it your 2020 vision over the next three years, here are three things you need to learn. Number one, you need to learn discernment. 
That's an important concept in the Bible. Discernment is knowing which door to walk through and which door to not walk through, which one to walk past and, and to avoid the waste of time and money and energy. And my prayer for you as your pastor is the same prayer that Paul prayed in Philippians 1. This is my prayer for you, that your love will keep growing more and more. God wants you to grow more and more in love because God is love. Notice, with knowledge and greater discernment. Circle that phrase, greater discernment. God says, I want you to grow in love. I want you to be more loving three years from today, but I want you to be loving with knowledge and I want you to be loving with discernment. So that you, notice the rest of the verse, so that you will be able to make the right choices. Notice what helps you make the right choices? Love, knowledge, and discernment. How do you get discernment? We'll talk about that. Number two, second thing you're gonna need to learn for God to open the doors in your life is you're gonna have to learn courage. You're gonna have to learn courage to walk through the right doors because you may know the right thing to do, but you're still scared to death to do it. You may know the right thing to do, but you don't have the faith to actually take the step. It's not enough to just know it, you've gotta have the courage to do it. Now what is courage? Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is doing the right thing even when you're fearful. Courage, if you're not afraid, you have no courage. Courage is when you do the right thing even when you're scared to do it. It takes courage to go ask forgiveness from somebody. It takes courage to offer forgiveness to somebody, to reconcile with somebody. That takes courage. And you're scared to death, but you do it anyway. And, and this is something you have to learn. In, in 1 Chronicles 28.20, uh, David's advice to Solomon. Solomon has been given the assignment of building the temple, which is an enormous building project. And he's feeling a little overwhelmed. David says, be strong, be courageous, and get to work. Don't be frightened by the size of the task, for the Lord God is with you, and he will not fail or forsake you. He will see to it that everything is finished correctly. If God's in it, he doesn't sponsor flops. And you're going, so just have the courage to walk through the right door. Personally, every major decision I've made in my life, both in my personal life and as a pastor of this church, every major decision, I was scared to death to do. I just did it anyway, because I am never gonna let fear dominate my life. I am not gonna let fear run my life. So I constantly move against my fears. I do the things that I fear the most. Fear does not respond to logic. Fear does not respond to complaining. Fear responds to action. You gotta step into the pool, jump in. You gotta step into the Jordan River or the Red Sea. You take the first step full of fear, full of fear. And when you do the right thing and you're full of fear, at that moment, you are a courageous woman. You are a courageous man. What is it you're afraid to do? Now I'm gonna come back to this, I'm gonna teach it to you again because it's so important. You'll hear it again in this series. Most people miss God's will for their life out of fear. Because what they say is, I've got this option out here, door number one or door number two or door number three or just door number one, that's the only one. And I go, and you're going, I just don't feel peace about it. And because I don't feel peace about it, then I'm gonna do nothing. And most people do nothing because they never feel peace about going through that door. Let me explain something to you. You're not gonna feel the peace on this side of the door. You're not supposed to feel the peace on this side of the door. You only get the peace of past understanding after you go through it in obedience while you're scared to death. And once you get through it, then God gives you the peace. But if you're waiting in advance for God to give you peace before you buy a house or start a job or do anything in life, you're gonna go through life doing not very much. You're not supposed to feel the peace on this side of the door. In fact, if God asks you to do something, it's gonna be big, so it's probably gonna scare you. This is a test. Will you trust me in faith? Will you be courageous? Will you walk through the door even though you're not at peace? And when you walk through that door and, you, and you've come through on the other side, then the peace 
comes. Don't expect the peace to come before you obey. It doesn't happen that way. God only gives you the peace after you obey. Does that make sense? Okay, and so you've been looking for something, for a sign on whether I should do this and this or this, God's gonna give me peace. It's not gonna happen. If it's a big deal in your life, the peace comes afterwards. That's courage. And I could teach you how to be a courageous person. Okay, number three. Third thing you're gonna have to learn, and we already referred to this, but we'll come back to it again. You're gonna have to learn how to open doors for other people. And you can get good at this. You can become a pro at opening doors. You say, I don't even have many doors open for me. Hey, start opening doors, being nice to people, being kind to people, being hospitable to people, showing hospitality to people, opening your home for a dinner to somebody. Just something that's uh, an act of love. And watch what God does. 1 Peter 4, 9, open your home to each other, to others and show hospitality without grumbling about it. Each of you should use whatever gifts you have received from God to serve others. So I want to open doors for you. I want God to open doors for you. So I'm going to help you open doors for others during this campaign. And we've got a whole bunch of new tools that we've developed, some of them we've never, ever done before in a campaign. Uh, in the past, every time we've done 40 Days of Purpose, 40 Days of Community, Daring Faith, all the 30 or so different spiritual growth campaigns, in the small group, I make a series of videotapes, you watch those videos, you study them, you answer the questions, you'd have a discussion time, and you grow through discussion and study. This campaign is gonna be very different because our groups aren't gonna do any study like that. Instead, I'm gonna give you some activities that I call open door activities. And there'll be fun stuff, stuff to do. Inviting people for dinner. We're gonna do a thing called the Red Door Project. And we're gonna do a week of hot topics, live topic seminars, where you invite your friends to pick a seminar they'd like to go to, not at the church, but in your home. And a bunch of other different things, totally different, because this is not something you learn by listening, this is something you learn by doing being hospitable, being loving, opening doors for other people. So I'm gonna help you to learn discernment, I'm gonna help you learn courage, and I'm gonna help you learn how to open doors for other people. Now we're gonna start this on Easter Sunday. Seven times in the Bible, Jesus uses the phrase, I am, and he defines himself. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He says, I am the good shepherd on Easter week, I will do two messages on uh, Thursday and Friday, Good Friday services. I'm gonna, we're gonna look at, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. What does that mean? Well, what are you hungry for? You ever been hungry for something, you go grazing in your refrigerator and nothing satisfies? Yeah, what people are looking for in life is God and they don't know it. He's the bread of life. And they're hungry, but they're, looking at, they're trying, all, trying this, trying that. And then on Saturday and Sunday for Easter services, I'm gonna do, Jesus said, I am the door. Well, the door to what? The door to purpose in life, the door to meaning, the door to forgiveness, the door to heaven, the door to your past forgiven and home in heaven, the door to happiness, the door to wholeness, the door to health, the door to peace of mind, the door to joy, all these things. And on Easter Sunday at Lake Forest, and at every other thing, we are building a giant door, a double door, and at the top it's gonna say, Jesus said, I am the door. And on the doors it's gonna say, door to happiness and health and hope and peace and purpose and power and love, door to real life. And at the end of the service, last year for Easter, 72,000 people came to Saddleback for Easter service. At all of our service, 72,000. And so during the end, at the end of the service, I'm gonna walk down off the stage and I'm gonna personally open those giant doors and say, now this, is, this, this can't save you, but if you're saying Jesus is my door, I'm gonna invite you to get up and walk through this door. And I'm gonna stand here and shake your hand as you do. That will be a moment. That will be a moment. And... 
to get ready for that, a couple things. One, if you're inviting a friend with you and you're sitting next to them uh, at that point in the service, you can say, and I'll say this to them on that day, you can say to them, if you wanna go forward, I'll be glad to go with you. Walk with them and walk with them. You don't to, they don't have to do it on their own. I mean, well, that's what friends do. We love people. They say, you wanna go forward, I, I'd be glad to walk with you. And you walk through that. Second, I'm gonna need some of you to volunteer to be a counselor, to pray with somebody who's a brand new believer. And we're gonna give them a packet of material and if you'll help me with that, um, I'm gonna ask you to, to take out a card in a minute and write the word counselor on it and um, drop it in the basket and I'll invite you to a one hour training with you and me to have you help me on the week that uh, the new believers come to Christ at, at Easter. That makes sense? We're gonna put a door at every campus. It'll be a wonderful, wonderful time. And it'll be a visual uh, uh, example that I am saying I have accepted Jesus Christ as the door to real life. Inside your program, there is a, a little handout. Would you pull that out? It says Easter Prayer Covenant. We've done this every year now for a couple years where I promise to pray for your friend that you're gonna invite to Easter if you give me their name in advance. Now I'm not talking about inviting family members who already know the Lord or inviting neighbors who are already Christians. I'm saying if you're gonna invite somebody at Easter, they're more likely to come to church than any other time at Easter. If you're gonna invite a friend that you care about, you want in heaven, they don't know the Lord yet, you write their name down there and I will pray for them by name. Last year, I prayed for over 3,000 people by name aloud. This is my commitment to you as your pastor. It says, God wants everybody to know the good news. And if you will think of somebody you could invite that who doesn't know the Lord, write their name down there. And if you'll invite them, I'll pray for them. That's our covenant together. All right, let's bow our heads for prayer. And with our heads bowed, I want you to say, God, who do you want me to invite at Easter? Just think about that right now. Who do you want me to invite at Easter, who doesn't know you. Maybe a neighbor, maybe a coworker at work, somebody you went to school with, friend, a relative that doesn't know the Lord. Say, Lord, who do you want me to bring? This is one way of opening a door. You open a door to salvation when you invite somebody. This is, God's gonna be looking at this. Are, are you gonna open a door? for somebody else. In just a minute after I finish praying, you write their name down on that card and drop it in the basket and I'll pray for them and you. Lord, I am very excited about this new series. I know that you have opened so many doors for me, for our church. I wanna see you open doors in amazing ways in the lives of our people, our family, our brothers and sisters in this family of God. Teach us how to open doors for others. Teach us diligence, teach us discernment. And most of all, teach us courage to do the right thing even when we're scared to death to do it. Help us to put into practice all that you teach us from your word. Help us to know who you want us to invite at Easter and to make that effort to open the door for somebody else. I pray your blessing on everybody who's listening right now at every campus, online, that you would bless their bodies, their minds, their hearts, and their relationships. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thanks for checking out this message on YouTube. My name is Jay and I'm Saddleback's online campus pastor and I would love to invite you to join our online community. Here are three ways you can take a next step. First, learn more about belonging to our church family by completing Class 101 online. Second, don't do life alone anymore by getting into an online-only small group that meets on platforms like Skype or learn more about hosting a group with your friends in your home. Third, join our global Facebook community to connect with others with the online community and be more engaged in the day-to-day. -to, -day. to take any of those next steps, visit saddleback.com online or email online at saddleback.com. 
Hope to hear from you soon.